Hello, thank you for joining us for today's discussion. My name is Laurie Mason and I'm Cadre Senior Field Marketing Specialist. I will be turning it over to your speaker in just a few moments, but first I'm going to hit on some high level items. For those who are not familiar with Cadre, we are a women owned business and for over 25 years, our number one priority is based on making sure your information is secure. We have been helping mid-market companies lower their costs, gain more control and increase the impact of their efforts. If you have any questions as the speaker is going through today's discussion, please send them through the chat feature and we will be dedicating a few moments toward the end of this webinar for a Q&A session. Lastly, everyone is in listen only mode for audio quality. With that, I will turn it over to our speaker so he can introduce himself to get things started. Good morning, Roger. Good morning, thanks, Laura. And thanks everybody for showing up for my talks today, nuclear ransomware and many ways to hack multi-factor authentication, MFA. This is actually two of, normally these are two different talks that are one hour long a piece, uh, but uh, uh, Cadre uh, picked both to do uh, together. And I think they're actually my most popular talk. So I'm kind of delighted. I've kind of picked out the highlights of what will, you know, of both talks and giving you the most important information. I think this will be one of the best talks I've done, but it's going to be very fast. So normally what I do in two hours, I'm going to scrunch into about 50 minutes, try to leave a couple of minutes for questions and answers at the end. Uh, I talk, if you haven't met me before, I'm Roger Grimes, Data Driven Defense, you know before, I talk fast all the time, even when I don't have to put two one hour presentations into 50 minutes, uh, but I've been doing computer security 34 years. I've earned all of these gray hairs. I've written 12 books and over 1100 magazine articles on computer security, got lots of certifications. There are some of my books. Uh, the second talk I do, Hacking Multi-Factor Authentication. There is uh, the, the book that it's kind of based upon. That, that, that's my latest book out of the 12 that just came out a couple of months ago. I work for No Before. We're the world's largest integrated security awareness and simulated phishing platform vendor. I've been with No Before for a bunch of years and I love working for No Before. It's my favorite company ever, uh, truly say that. I would say I'm doing it without being paid, but they're actually paying me. Uh, but we're going to talk about these two different topics today, starting with ransomware and how it's becoming more malicious. So initially, ransomware traditionally, and let me say the first time I ever saw ransomware was 1989, something called the AIDS Cop Trojan. And I remember that it was actually made by a William and Mary College professor, strangely enough. Uh, but in about 2005, it really kind of took off because Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies allowed ransoms to be paid without the criminals being caught. But traditional ransomware is, you know, some, somebody gets tricked into downloading the malware or they have unpatched malware or weak passwords or something and it breaks into a company and then it encrypts the device or the data or these days it will collect enough network passwords to spread around and encrypt a whole bunch of computers but traditional ransomware and you know encrypts uh files and folders and databases and then says hey you pay me uh or you know or we're going to keep that information encrypted or those files and those uh, servers locked up uh which can you know cause all kinds of problems it has it has significantly it has caused significant operational problems across tens of thousands of companies, police stations, hospitals, computer security companies, uh, entire cities like the city of Baltimore, entire huge public school systems. It really has been a pain. But over the last couple of years, people are taking great, uh, the defenders are starting to make sure that they have really good backups, right? So that if they get hit by ransomware, we were supposed to always have really good backups, but ransomware kind of proved that we really didn't have great backups. Uh, but so what people started to do is to make sure that they had good offline backups uh, that they could restore if they needed to if ransomware hit. And uh, they started not, the ransomware people started not to get paid as much. They, they were getting paid somewhere around 20 to 40% of the time, and then it started to lower so over the last year, starting at the end of 19 of 2019, uh, they started to do five things and made ransomware far more malicious. And I started calling it nuclear ransomware. But essentially, the ransomware crooks got tired of victims saying no because they had a really good backup. And they realized that what they had was ultimate access. The hackers have ultimate access into somebody's device and or networks, and they could do anything that they wanted to do. And encrypting data and holding it for hostage was the least of the victim's worries. So they started doing, again, end of 2019, really in 2020, it became huge. Now this is what 70% of ransomware does. Uh, this, so you're, you're lucky 
if you get ransomware that only encrypts your files uh, that, you know, and if that's all it does, again, knock on wood, uh, because this is what most ransomware programs are doing. Number one, they're stealing the intellectual property and data off of corporate networks. So they'll go in, the, the hackers actually spend time exploring the network, find out what is the most important data, the most valuable data, uh, you know, customer list, emails and things like that. And then they exfiltrate it outside the company and say, if you don't pay us, we're going to release this to other hackers, to your competitors, or just to the public internet. They're also stealing lots of password, logon credentials for not only the company, it used to be they just steal passwords to be able to spread throughout the same organization, but now they're actually stealing you know, every website password they can get to business and professional. They're stealing logon credentials of employees you know, when they go to visit websites uh, and also of customers. If you have a customer facing uh, website for your organization, they'll steal those credentials knowing that those customers oftentimes reuse those credentials elsewhere. They are threatening and ransoming uh, the victims, employees, and customers, and letting them know that they're only doing that because the original victim, their boss, or their or their their um, you know vendor didn't pay the ransom. Uh, they're using stolen data to better spearfish uh, other customers and partners. So they'll break into a company, kind of take over someone's email account, and send out spear phishing emails uh, that then are harder to recognize as being phishing emails. So they're a lot more successful and take over more companies. And then they're publicly shaming these companies who many times when companies hit, get hit by ransomware, they're trying not to let everybody know about it. They'd like to keep it as quiet as possible. Uh, but in any case, all five of these things, a good backup is not going to save you. And this was so successful that the average ransom over the last year or two, the average ransom paid went from about sixteen or twenty-six thousand dollars to about a quarter of a million dollars. And the amount of victims, the percentage of victims paying, it it, it, it fluctuates all the time, somewhere between 40 and 80, 90 percent, but it's closer to the upper end now because a backup doesn't save you. And what are you going to do if they have your customer data or they have your intellectual property and things like that? So again. Very frequently, 70% of the time, they are going to look around your network. They're, the average ransomware program is in a network somewhere between 8 to 12 months before it actually goes off and asks for the ransom. So they'll spend their time looking around. They'll, uh, they'll intercept and eavesdrop on email and databases and sales. They'll find out what are the crown jewels of the organization. Uh, they'll target databases and, and customer databases, product databases, copying uh, gigabytes and terabytes of data. Uh, and again, they say, if you don't pay us, we're going to post that information publicly or give it to your competitors. Like I've even heard of them going, if they break into law firms, they go to other law firms to go, hey, you wanna see the case files and defense of the person that you're going against? Um, and the first ransomware group to do this was Maze back in November of 2019, but they've all picked it up now because they saw how much success. So the first time I remember learning about this data breach exfiltration was the Maze ransomware back in November 22nd, 2019. They actually had threatened it for a couple of months before then. They actually said, hey, we're going to steal your data, and if you don't pay us, we're going to release it, but they didn't release the data when the ransom wasn't paid. But in November 2019, that's when they actually finally did exfiltrate the data. People, victims started paying up a lot more. It happened a lot more, even like the city of Pensacola got hit. That's nearby where I'm living in Tampa, Florida. Uh, and then Nimpty picked it up. Uh, you know, Soda Beniki picked it up. And by, you know, January, February, the majority of the ransomware gangs and their malware had started exfiltrating data. They hit big companies, little companies, big companies, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, SpaceX. Oh, my goodness. Hit an Elon Musk thing. Um, they, they even attacked some law firms. Like here, they, they wanted uh, $21 million, and they doubled the uh, request from $21 million to $42 million for Lady Gaga's lawyers and Madonna's lawyers and Donald Trump's lawyers. And you can see uh, they even attacked an energy company, selling 10 terabytes of data, uh, and they also deleted or encrypted the firm's backups. Uh, and this is the R Evil group. Uh, so it just you know became a way of life of how ransomware works. Even auction off the data. Here's an example of where one group took some company's information and then tried to auction it off for a hundred thousand dollars. The, the buy now price is a hundred thousand dollars, but the start price is fifty thousand dollars. And I don't think that this ransom got them any money, but it just shows you kind of the goal of what they're doing is they're holding auctions now, the eBay of ransomware, you know, and there could be people willing to pay for that sort of information.
And again, you know, uh, one of the other times I remember uh, that this directly impacted me was my information got stolen from TravelX. TravelX is kind of a, or at least as I know TravelX, is there are these little shops that are in the airport that allows you to convert your currency from your whatever currency you have in your pocket to some other foreign currency. I oftentimes would visit TravelX as I traveled outside the country and back into the United States, and they would, uh, you know, convert my currency. They always took, a, I think, too big of a hit. I was always amazed by how little money that I got back from them sometimes, especially sometimes like I would transfer the money in, you know, give them like a thousand bucks and come back and give them a thousand bucks. I hadn't spent any of the currency. I was able to use my credit cards. And it seemed to be that I, I was like, got much less money back. Like sometimes it was like six, 700 bucks. It was a big chunk they would take. But anyways, they had not, uh, TravelX had not patched their VPN servers, even though the patches were out. And that's how the attackers broke in and put the ransomware. They actually asked for $3 million ransom uh, and then TravelX said, no, we've got a good backup. We're not paying you. And then the ransomware attacker said, hey, we've actually got five gig of your sensitive customer data, including passport information. So security numbers, uh, you know, date of births, credit cards, and we want six million. So they actually, and this is, I've seen this trend where they'll ask for something that people like, no, we got a good backup. And then they'll reveal, hey, we have your data and we want double or something like that. TravelX was down for at least 18 days operationally. They didn't get fully operational till months later. And their parent company actually put them up for sale in April of last year. And they said, we're selling them for two reasons. One is, and selling them for cheap, by the way, um, because one, because of, and probably mainly because of the COVID impact, it impacted airport travel. So it decreased the amount of revenue that TravelX you know, had just in selling currencies to travelers. But they also put in their financial statement, also due to the damage of the ransomware event. So, I mean, that was pretty amazing. First time I remember ever reading that sort of thing. Uh, Ransom now, ransomware typically steals all kinds of passwords now. So it used to be that they just steal the Windows passwords or Windows network passwords or service account passwords and spread across the network. Not Petia did that, was one of the first to do that, but only to propagate so they can infect more machines in the network. But now they try to, they, they run a Trojan called TrickBot, which was a standalone Trojan horse program that was built to collect passwords. It would look in the browsers, look in memory, look on the disk, still as many passwords as it can and ransomware started incorporating that code that trick bot code into it and they would steal all kinds of passwords like uh, here's an example came from brian krebs's website but this company got broken into got ransomware and they stole people's personal and business banking portal. so imagine you're at work and you go to your bank website to take a look at the balance or something or, or pay a bill and boom now they've got your banking uh, account password they got their office 365 accounts their direct deposit account portals their health insurance management portals prescription management services payroll services shipping and postage account portals you know so they're like getting everything uh, but also amazon facebook linkedin microsoft and twitter accounts not just for the organization, but for employees, you know, so we're at work and we're like, oh, I want to buy something on Amazon, you know, but and have it waiting for me when I get home or tomorrow or whatever. Well, they're stealing that information and then they're able to take over your account or at least threaten to take over your account. And that's what they do too now is that they will oftentimes target the employees of the victim organization. So it, especially if the victim organization doesn't pay. So they'll notify the employees uh, by you know, email or whatever means that, hey, we have your information. We have your passwords for your bank account and Amazon and all this stuff. We're getting ready to release it all to hackers. And we're only doing this because your employer didn't pay the ransom. He didn't care about you enough to pay the ransom. And then they'll ask him for like 300 bucks, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks or something like that. That. And, the, and the same thing with the customers is they will reach out to customers if they've stolen customer log on information or personal information, you know, billing information, payment information, whatever their private details are. And they'll say, hey, the, the company you do business with, they didn't pay the ransom. And because of that, we're going to now ask you for the ransom and we're going to make your life, you know, a living hell because that person didn't want to pay the ransom. They didn't care about you enough to pay the ransom. And, you know, that's pretty, pretty wild, right? It's causing you know, if you're a customer and you know that the parent organization lost the money and didn't care enough to pay the ransom to protect your information, and now you're being ransomed, not going to make you feel great about that vendor. Same thing as an employee. You know, if your employer didn't pay the ransom and now you've got to deal with this. And, and again, they are actually attacking customers of compromised companies. The first time I remember reading this was again, uh, November of 2019. 
where this plastic surgery center had been hit by uh, ransomware and they didn't pay. And then the, the hackers actually contacted the plastic surgery patients, the, uh, the clients of that plastic surgery center and said, hey, if you don't pay us, I think it was a thousand or 1500 bucks, we're going to release your before and after photos and other details uh, on publicly on the internet. So you can imagine how many people are trying to, you know, take something they don't think looks that good and make it better. And I don't know about you, but the before photos, like, you know, even if it's like a breast or something where they're putting the markings, the highlighter markings all over it, it's not really an attractive look, right? It's not like something that you want in a magazine. And I don't know about you, I don't want my after photos on the internet of some body part that I've had fixed or something like that, but they did. They, they extorted them and said, hey, this plastic surgery center didn't pay, so we're going to blackmail you. I saw it again. There is this uh, mental uh, mental health facility. I think it was in the Netherlands um, that they had compromised, and they came across thousands of patient records for teenagers. And imagine teenagers telling their therapist, you know, their deepest darkest secrets. And I don't I don't know about you, but when I was a teenager, I was uh, pretty emotional, and uh, you know given to wide swings. And I'm sure if I was, you know, getting mental health therapy, uh, you know, I would probably share a lot of things I wouldn't want the adult people around me to know. And I no longer believe in those things, but you know, when you're a kid, you're a kid. Uh, but the ransomware people actually contacted them and said, hey, you know, your physical therapy center didn't pay, so I need you to pay. Uh, you know, and you're going to have to pay, it says here, uh, 200 euros in 24 hours. So we go from 200 euros to 500 euros. And then after 72 hours, if you didn't pay, that information would be published. And they did. Over 300 records had been published on the dark web, uh, you know, which is really just amazing that years later, and this, this particular guy being interviewed said, I didn't even know that they were putting my therapy sessions and what I said into a computer database, you know, that for it to be stolen. Uh, but very common where they're attacking these employees and customers. And again, they'll use the information they learned in the compromised company uh, to then attack partners and customers to send these realistic spear phishing attacks. We call it third party phishing, but you know, you typically tell employees, well, don't open an email from somebody you don't recognize. Don't open a document that's unexpected or whatever. But these fishers, you know, these ransomware people are able to use the actual email account. So when the phishing email comes, it comes from somebody you know and trust from a valid email address that you've seen many times before. It contains a subject a thread that you're involved in with that person. And then they ask something maybe a little bit weird. Hey, for the next invoice, send it to the, we're changing bank, send it to this bank instead or something like that. It's called known as third party phishing. And it's one of the fastest growing fishing segments and it's really more difficult to stop, uh, you know, than the other easier stuff with the bad grammar and coming from an email address you've never seen before. They also the ransomware gangs are trying to publicly shame companies so that they can't hide, you know, they're, they're trying to bring it out in the open and um, they actually when I used to write for InfoWorld magazine and CSO magazine, they actually reached out to me the ransomware groups and tried to get me to publish the different companies they would broken into and what they're asking for ransomware wise and that they had the data. But I remember I, I talked to my publisher and editor and we all agreed that we weren't going to become like this unofficial public relations PR arm of the ransomware groups. So they actually started using their own websites, their own blogs and announcing every time they broke into a company, hey, we've broken into this company, we've broken into that company. And here's, they would actually say what they stole, give examples of what they stole to prove that they had stolen it. Uh, they even reached out like this is, you know, to another blog reporter going, hey, you know, they are evil ransomware group just dumped the files of American Fashion House Kenneth Cole, which I think is funny. I've never heard of American Fashion House Kenneth Cole, so that means I'm both not fashionable, <laughs> and I would have thought they were like attacking a person, but they're like, hey, you know, they, they claim to have 60,000 personal data and 70,000 financial and work documents, and there's some examples of it, you know, and then they even announced that, hey, Kenneth Cole paid, you know, Kenneth Cole's good guys who value their reputation, be like Kenneth Cole and take care of your nerves and money, right? So kind of wild. And here is an example of a website. This is a, of a company that sells big, expensive yachts. They got uh, hacked into with ransomware and uh, they actually changed the main webpage of, uh, of, of denisonyachtsales.com to say this, 
because Robert Dennison failed to take very simple security measures on his devices, I hacked into all of his employees' Google accounts that were hosted under the, the, the domain name of DennisonYachtSales.com. All company leads, accounting, archives, employees, social security numbers, employee signatures, including the data that sent from clients of Dennison Yachting to the mail accounts of the companies under my control. If you ever conducted business with Bob Dennison, your private data might be in my hand right now. So that is the threat to employees and customers. What do I ask for? I want Bob to send me 15 Bitcoin. What will happen if my demand is not fulfilled? Let me say, I don't know whether Bob paid it or not. When this countdown finishes, when I first saw the countdown on the bottom of the screen, there was like five days left. And then I saw when it was three days and I wanted to take a screenshot here. It was less than a day. When the countdown here finishes, all that data that was mentioned previously would be publicly available for anybody that visits this webpage. And they initially, again, put this at denisonyachtsales.com, but they actually opened up and bought a new domain name called denisonextortion.com, got an email address called denisonextortion at Proton, which is a free public encrypted anonymous email service, you know, and said, hey, you can send, you know, if you want to buy your data out, you can contact me, Bob, this is your fault, don't make other people, other people pay for your fault, you know, and if this website shuts down, you can uh, track the countdown on denisonextortion.com. So they'd open that all up ahead of time before they launched the ransomware attack. So I knew that when denisonyachtsales.com got shut down, when they're trying to clean it up, that I could go to this denisonextortion.com and, and, and see the extortion going on. And again, I don't know if this company uh, paid the extortion or not, but this is really, really common. This is what's happening in the vast majority of ransomware cases today, exfiltrating data, exfiltrating credentials, you know, trying to cause public embarrassment, trying to force them to pay. And a backup's not gonna save you. Uh, and this is the new norm. And it may somehow get worse in the future. I didn't think it was gonna get worse, but it seems to have gotten worse. And if it's 70% of ransomware attacks today, it's probably gonna be 80, 90, 100% of the next day, of the, of, of the next year. But anyway, it's pretty wild. Well, I'll save your questions for the end, but now we're gonna go into the many ways to hack multi-factor authentication. I'm going to show you some uh, some interesting ways to hack multi-factor authentication, but just remember, all things considered, MFA is usually better than like a single than single factor authentication, a login name and password. Not always, but the vast majority of the time, and we all should try to strive should strive to use MFA when we can and where it makes sense. But what I want to push out here is that MFA isn't unhackable. A lot of people get an MFA device and they think, oh, I can't be hacked or I'm significantly harder to hack. And that just isn't true. So one of the things, uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is one of the most common types of MFA hijacking or bypassing is called network session hijacking. Every time you log into an application, an operating system, uh, a website, certainly, uh, after you successfully log in, no matter how you log on in, you get what's called this access control token that essentially means, hey, you successfully logged in, and it kind of allows you to access protected resources without having to re-authenticate. On a website, that uh, access control token is almost always a text-based cookie that's sent back and forth between the website and your browser and stored in your browser's cookie cache. But if an attacker can trick you into coming to their website first, they can do a man in the middle attack. So they'll create a website that looks like the website you think you're going to. They'll capture any information you send and they'll forward your information onto the eventual website that you meant to go to. And they'll capture all the information sent back to you uh, so that they can change, look at, eavesdrop and change the information. They don't care how you authenticate or whether it's just a password or whether you're even using 10 factor authentication. They just wait till you successfully authenticate. And then when the website sends that access control token and that cookie, they capture it and allows them to take control of your session. So again, uh, this has been going on since like the late, at least the late 1980s. It's been done millions of times. It's a very common way to hack people and to get around multi-factor authentication. And I first saw it again in the late 1980s. I wrote about it in the late 1980s, early 1990s. It's been going on forever. There's hundreds of hacker tools that allow it to do it. But in essential, what, what it does, the bad guy's got to convince a victim to come to some rogue website, usually a lookalike website that really is just some malware program that's called a proxy. And then everything the victim puts in gets sent to the real website. Everything the real website does gets sent to the victim, but it's going through that man in the middle proxy website. They're able to grab that cookie uh, access control token and take it over. I'm going to show you a demo by Kevin Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick is a uh, is our chief hacking officer. He's probably one of the world's most infamous, hack, uh, infamous hackers. He hacks around MFA all the time. He's probably got more demos and videos. You can go to that link after this talk if you want to see the video again in a little bit more detail. Uh, but, you know, it is something that's been going on for, you know, 
dozens or for, for, for at least two or three decades. It's a very common technique. So I'm going to try to cancel out of sharing my uh, PowerPoint here, and then I'm going to reshare uh, my, the video that I have up here. So hold on one second. Uh, I'm probably going to have to share my whole screen so I can give you the video. Uh, let's just let me get this. Where's the video? Here we go. There we go. I'm going to play this video and be back to you in about five minutes. Kevin Mitnick, Nova Forest Chief Hacking Officer. So I'm logged into my Gmail account. And if you take a look in the second email here, um, I'll go ahead and open it. It appears to be an email from LinkedIn. And ordinarily, when somebody wants to join your network on LinkedIn, LinkedIn will actually send an email to your email address notifying you of that. And if you're interested, you can go ahead and click interested, log into your uh, LinkedIn account, and authorize that person to actually become a connection. So if we take a look here, we have an email from LinkedIn that says, Kevin, I've read about your adventures and ghosts in the wires and so on, and this person wants to join my network. But this is actually a phishing attack. If we take a look here at where the email is originating from, it's not at linkedin.com, it's at this domain called llnked.com, which people might overlook. So let's go ahead and pretend that we're the victim here and go ahead and click on interested. And what that is going to do, it's gonna redirect us to the LinkedIn website to go ahead and log in. But let's move this over to the right and let that load. And if you take a look over here, we have a blank white page which is gonna become very important in a moment. And this is the attacker um, terminal session. So let's go ahead and bring back the virtual machine that's now connected to LinkedIn to authenticate because we, again, clicked on interested in the email. So we'll go ahead and put in a username, Johnny Boy at mitniksecurity.com. And now we're gonna go ahead and put in our secret password. And we're going to go ahead and click sign in. And we click when we click sign in, it's not going to allow us to log in. What LinkedIn is going to do is request our two-factor authentication code that LinkedIn is going to actually send to my mobile phone. And in a moment, you should hear a sound that the text message was received on my mobile phone. So let's go ahead and click sign in. And here we go. It's uh, telling us that two-step authentication is enabled. We just heard a message come into my mobile device. We're going to uncheck this box that says recognize this device in the future. And I'm going to open my mobile mobile device to take a look and see what the text message is, or what the code is rather. So the code here is 421 476. We're going to go ahead and click verify. And when we do so, it's going to log us into my LinkedIn account. So now we're logged into the LinkedIn account, but let's take a look at the attacker session over here on the left. So we're gonna scoot this over to the right. And over here, what we have is what we're able to intercept. So we're able to intercept the email address, which is johnnyboy at mitniksecurity.com. We're also able to insert, intercept the password to the account, which is no before rocks. And over here, this is not the actual six digit code, that was intercepted because you can't really use the six digit code again, the second factor. But what we're able to do is intercept the session cookie. And if you're able to steal the session cookie, or if rather the attacker is able to do so, they don't even need your username or password or second factor code. They can simply load the session key into a browser and they actually become you. So let me show you how this works. We're going to highlight the cookie, we're going to copy it to the clipboard. And then we're simply going to open up Chrome in incognito mode. And incognito mode just means uh, with privacy. So now we're going to go to the real LinkedIn website. When we go here, obviously we're not authenticated. Now it's, you know, wants us to log in with our credentials, but we don't have to do so. We're going to go ahead and go into developer tools. We're going to go into the console. And what we're going to paste into the console is the session cookie that we stole from the victim, which was myself, by the way. I'm gonna enter it. 
I'm going to head and close the session. Now, all I simply have to do to be logged into the victim's account with their session cookie is simply hit refresh that. So I hit refresh, and here we are. We're logged in, or rather hacked, my own account. So pretty wild, right? I mean, I don't think anyone ever sees that for the first time and doesn't go, wow, wow. So let me, I'm going to stop sharing, reshare my uh, window, my uh, PowerPoint. Um, but, you know, pretty amazing if you've not seen something like that before. Uh, and again, you can watch it again. But this sort of thing uh, has been going on. There's even been things like uh, Firefox, the browser has something called Fire Sheep once, an add-in anybody could add and kind of do the same thing in any coffee shop. Uh, you know, for a long time, it's I think it was probably about seven, 10 years old, but for a while, it was literally as easy as firing up an add in, going click, click, and you could still everybody's session tokens uh, in shared network environments. It was pretty wild. In this case, Kevin used a uh, hacking tool, white hat hacking tool called Evil Jinx. It's been around for like 10 years, been hacking around MFA for like six or seven years. But really, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, proxy programs like this that will work and allow someone to steal a network session cookie. Uh, so very popular type of attack. They've been used in the real world. Like here's somebody in news store or someone, this cryptocurrency trader uh, was tricked into um, visiting a fake Binance website. Binance is kind of like Coinbase. It's for, allows you to buy and sell cryptocurrency and stuff like that. Well, he got fished into going to the wrong one. Uh, and the fake Binance site sold his login credentials. They also hacked his 2FA security, which he was using Google Authenticator. Uh, and, and they were able to take it away from the happens. You know, this has been done again, hundreds of thousands, millions of times here. Iranian fishers bypass 2FA protections offered by Yahoo Mail and Gmail. It says here that when targets entered the passwords into the fake Gmail or Yahoo security page, attackers would almost simultaneously enter the credentials in the real login page, or if it was protected by 2FA, they'd redirect them to a new page that requested that one-time password and they, they would bypass it. Uh, so uh, another type of attack, instead of uh, trying to capture that, uh, that network session cookie that's being sent between the client and the server, if the attacker uh, can just break into the device that's using the MFA, it's kind of game over. That's one of those truisms in the computer world is that if, you're, you know, if your computer is taken over and owned by an attacker, it's not really your computer anymore. And that's quite true. If the endpoint device or operating system is compromised by hackers or malware, they can do anything that you do. You know, they can, uh, they can, again, steal that session cookie if they won't take it back to their system and become you are really common ways that they can start a second hidden browser session. I used to see this back in the late 1980s, early 1990s with something that's called Bancos Trojans. Bancos is Spanish or Portuguese for bank or banking. Uh, there are these Trojans that if they got in, you know, installed on your system, and again, they've been around for decades. They're still very popular, very, very popular, but essentially the malware breaks in and then it monitors where you go on the internet and then when you put in like you're going to your bank like bank of america or wells fargo or whatever it might be it then wakes up and, and, and will wait for you to log on in and it doesn't care how you log on in but once you do it opens up a second hidden browser session and all almost all operating systems you can open up a hidden browser session or you can even open up a new desktop session uh you know fairly easily programmatically script based and, and then open up uh, the browser in the bank or the financial system that you're interacting with doesn't know that it isn't you. And so you think you're visiting your bank to check your bank balance, but the Trojan is, you know, transferring all your bank balance to some new Russian bank uh, that you've never heard of. These are very, very common. Here's uh, a news clip from last year where the feds uh, targeted a, this is an 11 member gang. So there's only 11 people in this gang uh, and they're called Gaznem and they stole a hundred million dollars from 41,000 victims. The health, health of uh, the help of a stealthy banking Trojan. Uh, there are hundreds of these groups. They steal billions of dollars a year. They have stolen hundreds of billions of dollars over the decades. This is not a rare thing. This is a pretty common thing. If something gets into your desktop or to your mobile phone, in this example, it's game over. In this case, uh, it was a fake uh, optimization app. You know, everybody wants to get more battery life out of their phones. This app 
claim to be a bank optimization app for Android so it make your battery last longer, but really it was just a banking Trojan. And, uh, but it was, it waited for people to log into PayPal. And when people logged into PayPal, it actually just ran macro keystrokes. I'm not gonna play the video, but you should watch it. Like when it runs, the, the, the people just, you know, very quickly, they log on in to PayPal. And then like a second or two later, it looks like their screen's making all these, and they're like, what's that? But then it goes away. And if you don't realize it, all your money just got transferred to, you know, some Russian Chinese bank account that you never knew about. Uh, it's very common today for mobile Trojans to be banking Trojans. Here's one that's uh, called EventBot. It targets over 200 different financial organizations, including PayPal and Barclays and Capital One, uh, you know, and they intercept passwords. It intercepts the two-factor authentication codes as well. This one was posing as a legitimate flash update. Uh, and it could even, again, uh, it would even uh, grab permissions uh, and read uh, external storage and SMS, uh, you know, so that they could show their information on top of other stuff. And they could even do still what's called SIM information, uh, um, system accounts, SIM information. Why am I not saying SIM? Send a storage identity module information, system identity module information, but essentially still the information that allows the hacker to make his phone your phone so that all of a sudden all the calls and the SS messages are going to the hacker instead. Uh, so these Trojans are, you know, they steal the money, they can transfer your phone and phone information to their phone. It's pretty wild out there. And any of these SMS based MFA solutions, so short messaging uh, stuff can, they can, the hackers can fake those messages and they can transfer those messages to their phones. Um, uh, SMS-based MFA is probably the most common type of MFA on the internet today. It should not be because it's too easy to fake and steal, but it's still the most common type. And, you know, here, you know, we're all used to going to a website, trying to log on in. It's like, hey, we're going to send you a code. Here's some real life examples from me, from my bank, you know, Bank of America or whatever, Marriott or Office 365 or Facebook, or even I think it's kind of funny, ironically, the ID experts, my ID care. That is a service, an identity monitoring service that's designed to tell me if my identity gets stolen because it's provided for free by the U.S. government because my fingerprints were stolen. And the U.S. government three years ago said never use SMS-based authentication, uh, and yet the government's own identity monitoring service uses SMS-based authentication, as does many, many government websites. Uh, but there's the, uh, the SIM, the S stands for subscriber, subscriber identity module. Uh, but every cell phone today, or most of the cell phones today, have these subscriber identity modules. It used to be on this micro SD card, and you had to put that little card inside your phone. Early on, I think they were behind the battery, and then it became this little memory chip slot. And if you got a new phone, or your phone broke, and you had to get a new phone, you had to go find a paper clip, or take the battery out of your phone, find that little card, and put it in a new phone. And that's because that subscriber identity module is information that identifies your phone as your phone. It has the global unique identifier for your phone that travels with that SIM module. It has your, you know, your name, your account information, uh, it has your telephone number. It has information that allows you to connect to your cell phone network, you know, AT&T versus T-Mobile versus Verizon Wireless. And if an attacker can get that information, uh, they can actually trick your cell phone company into making their phone be your phone. Uh, and it happens. That's what they learned is that they could pirate it. They could, if they, a lot of times they just have somebody on the inside on the cell phone company and they pay them 50 or 75 bucks to transfer your SIM information to their phone. And when that happens, uh, your phone just kind of, uh, it just stops ringing and, and you don't get any more messages because the your cell phone service is now on the attacker's phone, but it doesn't say or tell you it's been stolen. All that happens is that your phone will say that it's out of network and maybe an hour or two or three hours later, you're like, man, I haven't got any messages or any phone calls to try to use your phone. It doesn't work. And then you call the cell phone company. They're like, oh, we transferred it to your new phone. You're like, uh, I don't have a new phone. Uh, and it can take people oftentimes a day or two to get their cell phone information back. And during all that time, the attacker is resetting your accounts, waiting for those, those SMS codes to be sent during the reset and taking over your accounts. This has been done tens of thousands of times. Uh, so much so, again, the U.S. government and what's called NIST Special Publication 800-63, the Digital Identity Guidelines, said nobody should allow SMS to be used as valid authentication because it's too easy to hack. Uh, people get hacked all the time, especially these poor cryptocurrency people like this guy at the top. He actually had $24 million 
in cryptocurrency stolen from him through no mistake of his own. He actually sued AT&T for $124 million. I don't know how that came out. I got to look that up one day. Uh, but people get money stolen all the time. You know, food writer Jack Monroe lost five 5,000 pounds and a number, the phone number hijacked. Red Edit was using uh, SMS based MFA to protect their network. That's what their admins, if you're going to be an admin and do an admin thing, they used SMS based MFA to protect the admin logins. They got one of the admins got, you know, uh, SIM swapped hijacked and then the attackers came in and compromised Reddit's network and stole data and I think tried to plant malware in the source code and stuff like that. So very, very, you know, or another example on that screen in the bottom left is some 20 year old college student had hijacked uh, more than five million dollars. So this is, you know, the opposite of rare. This happens all the time. Uh, so the defense is try not to, if you don't have to use an SMS based app, don't use it. Unfortunately, um, most of the time you have to, you're not given the choice. Uh, but there's even other ways like SMS can be faked. Anybody in an SMS message or a voice call for that matter can claim to be anybody. I can claim to be Bill Gates. I can claim to be Microsoft tech support. I can claim to be Gmail security. So, you know, I could send you a message if I know that you're a G, if I know your phone number and you have a Google address a Google Gmail address, I can say something like, hi, I'm from Google Security. We've detected a rogue sign into your good guy account. In order to determine a legitimate login, uh, we're going to send a verification code to your previously registered phone number. Who would possibly know that? Google, uh, from another Google uh, support number, please retype the sent verification code in response to this message or your account will be permanently blocked. You've got to put that stressor, you know, uh, you've got to do this right away type thing. And then the attackers just go to Gmail. They put in your email address. They act like they forgot your password. Gmail is nice. Like, hey, you want to try your last password? You say no. And then it will give you four or five ways to recover your account, one of which is SMS recovery. The attacker does that. It sends the code to the victim. And then the victim types it back in response to the original message. And the attacker takes that code and the recovery console and takes over the account, changes the password, changes other information. Sometimes we'll re-enable, unenable and re-enable MFA and it makes it impossible for the victim to recover the account. It's pretty wild. And just realize this can happen on voice calls, right? Someone can call you and go, hi, Mr. Grimes, I'm from your bank. Did you buy two plane tickets from Dallas, Texas to Kenya? We didn't think you did, Mr. Grimes. And we've blocked those two transactions. But no, we see $50,000 of other strange transactions transactions over the last couple of days. We just need you to verify who you say you are before we continue to help you. Uh, we need to know your login name and password, and we're going to send you a code. We need you to tell us the six digits of that code before we can continue. Okay, Mr. Grimes, you got the code. That's great. Thank you very much. And from that point forward, you're actually, then you're done. And yeah, you can't trust any SMS or phone call message. I mean, even the most authentication you get from SMS or a phone call is the phone number. And lots of, I can fake the phone number. Millions of people can fake the phone number. There's software and techniques for faking the phone numbers all the time. You cannot trust a phone call or SMS message to be from who it says it is, unless maybe you recognize the voice. But of course, with deep fakes, they can fake those voices. I've heard of phishing attacks where spammers actually recorded somebody's voice and then deep faked it back and stole money in a phishing attack between some bosses and were able to still like a million or two million dollars by pretending to be a boss so look out for that sort of stuff it's not it's not super uncommon of course any of these fake messages you get you know instagram someone tried to log into your instagram account click here to verify right you just can't trust these messages can't uh, trust someone calling in um and, and let me say that tech support at these phone companies uh, you know, like AT&T and Verizon Wireless, they know about SIM swapping attacks and these SMS based attacks. And so they've been trained to follow a, a particular script and set of instructions that if the tech support person follows that script to the letter will result in your account not being accidentally transferred a lot of the time. But what the attackers do is they know that human beings just want to be helpful and, and, and they can, you know, they can kind of just socially engineer the tech support person and being overly helpful because we're just humans and we want to help people. One of the best examples, and I've got it here, I'm not going to play this, uh, this unfortunately, because we just don't have time today, uh, but you can go to the link later on, was this uh, reporter went to DEF CON, Black Hat DEF CON in Las Vegas a couple of years ago, and he told this female social engineering white hat hacker, hey, here's my phone number. 
here's the, um, you know, the vendor I use, I think it was at and I want to see if you can take control of my phone account information. I told them not to let, you know, to, that we had the secret password that we agreed upon so it couldn't be switched and taken. Well, she uses his phone number in the name of that, uh, I think it was at and that she called in just a couple of minutes, completely takes over his account. The first thing she does, she fires up, downloads and fires up two YouTube videos of babies crying. And actually it's interesting, this is a great baby crying sound and it's now been blocked locked on, uh, on YouTube. I don't know why, but you used to be able to download it. Uh, but she actually fakes like she's a berated mother that was told by the husband to transfer this account and she didn't do it yet. And the husband's yelling at her. So she calls the AT&T person. She's like, hi, my name's whatever. She's got the babies crying. She goes, I'm sorry, I got two babies here and they're sick and they're hungry. And yes, honey, I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to do it. So she's acting like the husband's berating her. And she says, uh, I, me and my, we're moving, me and my husband, I was supposed to do this 15 days ago, but I didn't. And honey, I'm doing it, you know, and who doesn't want to help out that mother with two crit, uh, sick, crying, hungry babies with a mean husband? The uh, tech support person lets her take over the account. She, they, the, the tech support person says, oh, what's the email address that he logged in with? She makes something up and the person's like, nope, it's not that. She tries, no, nope, not that. And then the tech support person goes, it's this email address. She's like, oh, that's his old email address. He hasn't used it in a while. And she doesn't have the password. The tech support person tells her the password. Not only that, but then so the, the, the person gets complete tr control of her account and the hacker woman says, hey, uh, my daughter's going to college today. Can I get a new phone and charge for the account? They're like, yep. Uh, so it's an amazing video to watch if you want to see it. Uh, also duplicate uh, for time-based one-time password. This is another type of attack where we've all had either these devices like RSA secure IDs or these Google authenticators, probably one of the most popular MFA solutions today where you know every 30 seconds, every minute you get this new code. And the way that they work is that it's based upon time and every 30 seconds to a minute, the time gets updated and the code gets updated. Well, the way they're created is that there's this randomly generated seed value uh, it's called a seed value that is always stored on the device or the software instance and also in a database, the authentication database. So there's this randomly generated seed value. It also usually stores the global unique identifier of the hardware device or the software instance. And then there's an algorithm that says, okay, take the current time, take the seed value, take the global unique identifier, and then generate this code. And then every 30 seconds, make a new code. Well, it all works really great unless somebody, an attacker, is able to get into the seed generation or the seed uh, database, and it has happened. Uh, but when they get in there, if they learn that shared secret, then there's tools out there that allow them to generate new instances. Like in this case, I'm showing you a screenshot from a tool called Can Enable. I was able to use this back in the early 1990s. Can Enable stopped being updated around the end of uh, Windows XP Pro Service Pack 2, but it's still out there. Uh, although be careful, it could have some Trojans in it. But uh, literally, if you knew the serial number of the RSA Secure ID advice, you put in the serial number, put in the seed database that you stole from the database, and it would generate whatever code you wanted at whatever set time. In real life, uh, these RSA Secure IDs were compromised, the seed databases were. Uh, in one particular example, Chinese Advanced Persistent Threat APT broke into RSA, was able to steal the seed databases for all kinds of customers, including Lockheed Martin, and then they broke into Lockheed Martin with these fake RSA secure IDs implemented in software and were able to steal government and military secrets. Uh, and again, like if you have Google Authenticator, the seed databases are typically stored on like Linux servers within the network. And if the bad guy gets to them, they can fake these Google Authenticator things. Oftentimes when you're set up a Google Authenticator, you get this uh, quick response QR code. Uh, and that is really, that QR code is nothing but an 80-bit digit number. There's a numbers actually in there. And if an attacker gets that seed database and knows your email address, they then can fake what the Google Authenticator code instance is and make another one. Uh, you know, and hackers love it. Not only this, but those QR codes, if they can find the QR codes in your email or deleted folders or people take a picture of them on their cell phone, they never expire. So they can use them at any time. Here's some guy, another cryptocurrency guy complaining. He's like, oh, I'm now 95% certain as how my 2FA was bypassed. You're going to think this is crazy. But I had used the Google Authenticator QR code and I deleted it, but I didn't empty my mailbox. The hacker found it. And uh, he said, the, the moral of the story is destroy the key that was used to set it up. If you don't, it's worse than useless. If you leave a trace of the key, then the 
the 2FA serves only as a dangerous false sense of security. So you got to be careful of that because people can, if they get a hold of those C databases, they can create another instance. Again, the Google Authenticator QR code is just this 80-bit number. And as a side effect, the, the, or as a side note, the U.S. government says you really should have a 128-bit key because 80 bits is too weak and can be cracked. Uh, but you know, it's really only a problem if they have the number and your email address and know the Google Authenticator algorithm. But it turns out that the Google Authenticator algorithm was actually an open source project uh, that Google is involved in. And they pulled out and made it a proprietary one, but the algorithm is the same. And you can today go to GitHub, download Faro, and essentially, again, all, all you got to do is have that base 80-bit code, base, this is base 32, 80-bit code, and you can begin making a new Google Authenticator instance uh, and software, and people do. Uh, so just keep that. We're kind of running out of time now, uh, but download the slide deck. It's got lots of other cool attacks in it and things that you would, I think, love to see about stolen biometrics. Uh, you know, my password, my finger, all 10 of my fingerprints were stolen along with uh, 5.6 million other people's fingerprints that, it, that, that it's apply, uh, applied for government security clearance in the United States by Chinese advanced persist persistent threat attackers. And fingerprints get stolen all the time. If someone steals your fingerprints, I mean, if someone steals your fingerprints, how is any system that asks for your fingerprints to authenticate ever going to know that it's not you? Uh, but anyways, I've got some other cool attacks in here. Feel free to download this attack and, and, and download and read it and send me questions. Uh, some really cool stuff. Uh, I work for No Before. We do a security awareness training. We're big believers in educating people about the types of attacks that they may face and doing simulated phishing tests to see if they really understood those lessons and then applying uh, more uh, education to people that click on too many fishes from the simulated phishing attacks. We do know that customers that follow what I just said, which is educate your employees, do it at least once a month, do simulated phishing tests at least once a month. And if you do that, the uh, percentage of employees that will click on a phishing email, which is usually around almost 38%, drops to below 5% in a year. That is a significant reduction in risk. With that said, Lori's going to ask me some of your questions. If I don't get to your question, if we don't get to your question today, feel free to email me at rogerg at knowbefore.com, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. You can also follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn and ask questions there. With that said, Lori, did we get some questions in? We did. What an amazing presentation. So thank you so much. A few questions have come through the chat. Um, the first one is around ran ransomware. What is the number one step businesses can take to reduce their risk of a ransomware attack? Well, the vast majority of attacks are due to social engineering uh, and phishing. Uh, the, the stats range from like 40 to 91%, but whatever this, you know, depends on the survey and the time of year and who takes it, how they ask it. But no matter what the percentage is, social engineering phishing is always the number one most successful way that you get any type of attack, ransomware or otherwise, followed by unpatched software, which is around 20 to 40 percent. Those two things together account for 90 to 99 percent of the attacks in most organizations. So very popular. So if you want to stop ransomware or any malware or hackers, Fight social engineering and phishing using the best policies, technical defenses, and education that you can. Make sure you patch your software. Maybe number three best thing is make sure to uh, use different passwords on every website and service you have and change those passwords at least once a year. Great. Thank you. Um, another one on ransomware is how do you truly know that there isn't anything already hibernating? Uh, you don't. Uh, because if it was easy to know that ransomware was hiding, then, um, you know, the world would be the path to that vendor's door. Instead, I, I read about uh, somewhere between 85 to 95 percent of people hit by ransomware and malware had up to date antivirus. Uh, so it's very difficult to really accurately detect. But one of the best things that almost anyone can do is to use an application control program like in Windows App Locker, enterprise versions of Windows come with App Locker. But you enable the application control program in audit only mode. And when a new executable happens after you turn it on, it will generate an app locker's case, what's called a 8003 event log message. And you can research those messages and say, okay, some new executable that wasn't there before that we didn't install, that we didn't allow, let's go see whether it's bad or good. Almost all ransomware 
uh, will execute some new executable, even if it's what's called fileless or, 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 or you know, fileless malware, they typically create some new thread, some new executable, and the application control program will usually pick it up. Uh, but someone's got to investigate and say, is that new execution, is that something the end user meant to download, like Spotify or something, or is it something malicious? But if you really want to be able to detect ransomware, an application control program and enforcement or audit only mode is really one of the best things you can do. Okay, great. I know you had mentioned this in the presentation, but can you clarify, isn't using SMS-based MFA better than not using MFA at all? Um, yeah, you know, I, I guess. So that's a good question. Using MFA is better than not using MFA, but SMS is so easy to hack that really it should be avoided if you can do it. Now, many times you don't have a chance. You have to use it. But a lot of times there are, in, like with my bank, I can use the secure banking application. Let me say that uh, phone apps are typically, I like phone apps, especially if they do what's called push-based notification where it actually sends you a notification to your phone. It's like, is this you logging into your bank? Yes, I love those things. Uh, in my bank, if I use the banking app, very, very secure. But if I go to the website, if it sends me a 2FA code, for some reason it sends SMS. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, if I have the choice, I'm going to use the bank app so that I stay more secure than if I use this SMS-based thing. So, yeah, SMS-based MFA is probably safer, but of, there, there's so many different types of MFA out there, uh, FIDO2, time-based, one-time passwords and stuff like that. If you can avoid SMS, do it. It's probably better, but out of all the MFA types that I recommend anyone use, SMS is not at the top of that list. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, another one is, aren't biometrics unhackable? No, no. So that's a, that's a big, uh, common misnomer. Uh, everybody has different, let's say, fingerprints or retina scans. So suppose we don't know for sure that fingerprints are uniquely identical, you know, unique uh, in the world. We haven't taken everybody's fingerprints, especially of people that are alive and dead, like, you know, trillions of, not a trillion people, but hundreds of billions of people. Uh, but it is thought that your fingerprints, your retina scan, your hand geometry, you know, that sort of stuff is unique for you, or at least unique enough that it's going to work for us. The problem is all the readers, the fingerprint readers, the retina readers, the way that they read the information, they actually have to do it in a somewhat inaccurate way. Like for fingerprints, every day you're getting these micro abrasions and you're getting these cuts, these mini cuts and things like that. If they read your fingerprint for as unique as it is, uh, as best they could, there's a good chance that you wouldn't be able to use that same fingerprint the next day. And there's only a certain bit of information or points they call that is picked up. And so it ends up being that even though your fingerprint's unique, your fingerprint scan isn't. And they intentionally have to make the readers and deciders of whether your fingerprint's a true authentication, they have to make it weaker than it otherwise could be, or there'd be too many failures. Imagine, have you ever been using your cell phone with a fingerprint? You're like, recognize my fingerprint, recognize my fingerprint, recognize my fingerprint, right? If, if it happens too much, you're not gonna use it. So they try to make it a little bit or a lot less accurate, uh, which means then it can be spoofed and, you know, and not only that, but, you know, biometric, like your fingerprint, it's your, if it gets stolen, what do you do? I've had my fingerprints. I've had all 10 fingerprints stolen in one attack. How, how can any system relies upon my fingerprint ever say it's really me versus in this case, you know, Chinese attackers or something like that. So the biometrics are all right if they're paired with another factor, like something you know or something you have maybe, but just used alone, I'm not a huge fan. Wonderful. Okay, um, now I'm curious. What is your opinion and what do you think is the best MFA solution? Uh, every uh, MFA is different for different companies. Some companies like uh, like biometrics, some companies like card-based tokens. Some, a lot of companies like the phones because everybody's got a phone and they don't have to worry about losing this hardware dongle or something like that. There's no best, but there, you know, the first thing I would say for anyone is figure out what you're trying to protect and then find out what MFA solutions protect the things you're trying to protect. It's 
no, no MFA solution, not even the most popular in the world, even works with 2% of the websites and services and, and applications you want to protect. So make a list of the things you're trying to protect, find out what MFA solutions might protect that, and then find out which ones work within your company. There's no such thing as a perfect thing. I will tell you that, again, I'm not a big fan of SMS or biometrics used alone. Uh, FIDO, I like FIDO2 keys. Those are really uh, fairly secure. If uh, time-based one-time password solutions that use uh, strong um, standards and stuff like that, I like. Uh, there's probably more things I don't like than I like, uh, but you know, it's you know, avoid the weakest stuff. Like if someone, if the MFA solution is like, we make our own encryption, you know, avoid that like the plague, you know, and try to again avoid SMS-based apps. I'm also a big fan of phone-based apps or that push-based technology. If you've ever been to like a Gmail account, they're you know, like, is that you trying to log on in? Go to your app. You have to go to the Google app on your phone. It's like, is this you logging in? And you say yes. Well, it can be hacked. It can absolutely be hacked, but it's better than you know SMS-based solutions or something like that. That might be a next webinar for you. Yeah, <laughs> actually, all the different actually it is. It is. <laughs> Sign me up. Um, it does look like we've addressed everything throughout the discussion in the Q&A session. At this time, there are no outstanding questions. I do encourage everyone listening, if you think of something after the fact or if you have a question that you would like to discuss, again, you're more than welcome to reach out, with, reach out to Roger or reach out to us. You can email us at info at cadre.net. Or you connect with us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. All you have to do is search for Cadre Information Security, and you will find us on each of those platforms. That should cover everything. Thank you again, Roger, for your time. And thank you, everyone that has joined. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.